can we just make Hello and welcome to this latest webinar in the HRSA Office of Women's Health, Women's Health Leadership Series. We're hosting today's webinar on women's mental health in conjunction with our colleagues in the HRSA Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs, IEA Region 9, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. Today we'll be featuring presentations from 2020 Mom and the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance. This webinar is also an observance of the 2022 National Women's Health Week. National Women's Health Week is an annual observance to encourage women and girls to reflect on their individual health needs and take steps to improve their overall health. My name is Stephen Hayes and I'm part of the HRSA Office of Women's Health. I'm joined by my OWH colleague Ellen Hendricks and Dr. Nidhi Jain in HRSA IEA Region 9, San Francisco. We will be tracking the chat to collect your questions for our Q&A session after all speakers' presentations are completed. It's now my pleasure to introduce OWH's director, Nancy Mautoni smith uh, Nancy leads cross-agency initiatives and consultations to advance the health, safety, and well-being of women served by HRSA programs. She currently oversees activities and initiatives that support the prevention of intimate, partner, and interpersonal violence, care coordination for women with opioid use disorder, and advancing cervical health within HRSA settings of care. Nancy previously served as the Deputy Director of OWH from 2016 to 2020. Prior to coming to HRSA, she served as the HHS Office of Population Affairs Headquarters in Rockville, Maryland, where she led service delivery program activities of the Title X Family Planning Program. She also worked at the Region 9 Office of the Regional Health Administrator, where she oversaw Title X Family Planning Programs throughout the region. A graduate of the University of Buffalo School of Social Work, Nancy received the 2015 Distinguished Alumni Award for her noteworthy contributions to the social work profession. She retired from the US Public Health Service in 2020 after a career spanning 20 years. And Nancy is also a proud Air Force veteran and served as clinical social worker within mental health and family maltreatment programs at Travis Air Force Base and Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Nancy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that wonderful inter introduction and welcome. Um, good afternoon and welcome to everyone on today's event on women's mental health. I'm Nancy Motoni smith as Stephen mentioned. I'm the director of the Office of Women's Health. And this event was uh, developed in collaboration and made possible by um, HRSA's Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs and our colleagues at SAMHSA. And it is part of our Office of Women's Health Leadership Series. And as Stephen mentioned, this event is being held in recognition of National Women's Health Week, which was observed last week from May 8th to the 14th, along with um, an observation of Mental Health Awareness Month, which runs throughout the month of May. And we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a disproportionate toll on women's mental health and well-being. And I'm really pleased for today's event, which will talk about our federal efforts, national policy and stakeholder engagement around this extremely important topic of women's mental health. Next slide, please. During today's event, you will hear from us, the Office of Women's Health, about National Women's Health Week and about HRSA's work in this area. You'll also hear from SAMHSA about their resources and their activities in women's mental health. And then we're gonna move into a discussion on national policy and stakeholder engagement around mental health care from the HRSA supported settings of the 2020 MOM and the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance. We've also set aside a few minutes today for questions at the end. So please use the chat box to raise any questions throughout today's presentation. And the presentation and transcript will be made available on our website after the event today. Um, a little bit about HRSA as our agency, as you get to know us, um, please help us as well get to know you by adding your name, your organization, and where you're joining us from if you've not already done so in the chat. So the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, is an operating division of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and we support a broad range of programs to provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically, or medically challenged. And every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including people with HIV AIDS, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and those un otherwise unable to access quality health care. Next slide, please. And the Office of Women's Health at HRSA provides leadership on women's health and sex and gender specific issues. And we're part of a network of women's health offices across the department. And we work within and outside of the Department of Health and Human Services to improve the health, wellness, and safety of women across the lifespan. Next slide, please. 
Again, this event is being held in recognition of several health observances, including National Women's Health Week, where we join with the HHS Office on Women's Health to encourage and remind women and girls to reflect on their individual health needs and take steps to improve their overall health. And Mental Health Awareness Month, where we work to raise awareness about the importance of mental health in the lives of all Americans. Next slide, please. Um, over the last several years, we've been faced with challenges that have highlighted many of the health disparities that existed previously, including those related to the opioid epidemic. And along with those challenges, we've seen enormous innovations in how healthcare and public health professionals are caring for those in need. One innovation towards improving the health of women and their families is, is a toolkit for providers and organizations developed by my office and the HHS Office on Women's Health. And I encourage you to review and share this resource with your networks. And it's available at the link that you see on this slide on the Office of Women's Health website. And next slide, please. HRSA's behavioral health work is extensive, ranging from efforts around behavioral health integration into primary care, leveraging telehealth and workforce training and placement through the National Health Service Corps. And some of the other key innovations and opportunities that you see here on this slide include the newly unveiled National Maternal Mental Health Hotline. And this HRSA supported initiative just launched earlier in this month and is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And it provides services in both English and Spanish via voice, text, and web chat. HRSA uh, Maternal and Child Health Bureau's partnership with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, um, includes the work being done around Women's Preventive Health Services, or WIPSI. And this is a set of preventive services recommendations, which, uh, in, among many other things, includes anxiety among their topics. And these um, um, are help define the range of services that are covered by um, health plans without cost sharing. HRSA also hosts the Integrated Behavioral Health Resource Library, which provides a hub for a range of resources to assist, assist healthcare providers with integrating mental health services into their practices. Next slide, please. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Emily Hassey. Emily Hassey is, uh, currently works at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, as a public health advisor and government project officer. She oversees the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center grant, grants for healthy, grants for expansion and sustainability of the comprehensive community mental health services for children with serious emotional disturbances and the mental health awareness training grants. She also assists with the child crisis portion of the 988 rollout across the country. And before working at SAMHSA, she gained experience working in direct care with children in the Texas foster care system who were abused and neglected and also has worked with public health agencies and LGBTQ plus health equity work. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the introduction. Well, everyone, I am Emily Hasse. I am from SAMHSA. I work in the Center of Mental Health Services and specifically I am in the Child, Adolescent and Family Branch. Um, we can go to the next slide. So the learning objectives we're gonna go over during my portion of this presentation, understanding the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center, Serious Mental Health Advisor, Illness Advisor, SMI Advisor, SAMHSA Resources for Women Throughout the Lifespan. And I just wanted to give a little bit of background note before this. Um, at SAMHSA, we do not have any women-specific grants. Um, and today I'll share the role of women uh, in a different, uh, and a couple of different grants, as well as resources SAMHSA provides. And you can go to the next slide. So the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center, the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center is committed to, oh, committed to providing training and technical assistance using a lifespan approach that focuses on mental health and substance use addiction challenges. Our approach is anchored by the underlying principles that families play a vital role in supporting their loved ones and are experts in regarding their family support needed. The technical assistance piece of this grant is mainly for the statewide family network grant 
that enhances the capacity of statewide mental health family controlled organizations to engage with family members and primary caregivers who are raising children, youth, and young adults with serious emotional disturbances, SED. Uh, you can go to the next slide. The National Family Support Technical Assistance Center serves families whose children of any age experience mental health and substance use challenges across the lifespan and the workforce, organizations, and communities that support them by providing resources, technical assistance, and training. This includes, but not as limited to, mental health and substance use information, training for families in the family support workforce, including family peer specialists, providers, clinicians, and educators mental health and substance use lifespan resources, connections to family support services, technical assistance for organizations. The National Family Support Technical Assistance Center is led by the National Federation of Families, a family-run organization in partnership with, with the Partnership to End Addiction, C4 Innovations, SAFE Project, and Boston University. The center's approach is anchored by the underlying principle that families play a vital role in supporting their children and are the experts regarding their family support needs. You can go to the next slide. The recipient of the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center grant is the National Federation of Families in which their mission is to, the National Federation of Families and, and, and the Na National Family Run Organization serves as the national voice for families of children who experience emotional, behavioral, and mental health and or substance use challenges across a lifespan. We advocate at the national level for the inclusion of family voice in all aspects of services and supports across clinical, educational, and community settings, promote, promote effective partnerships among families, professionals, and policymakers at the local, state, and national level, advance the value of lived experience in the family peer workforce to support families, collaborate with family-run and mission-aligned organizations to transform family-serving systems in healthcare in America. And you can go to the next slide. So the women's roles within the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center, it's a women-run organization. Majority of caregivers and guardians are women. Even when women struggle with their own mental or physical health, they're still the main caregiver. Women are the largest group of mental health providers. There's no specific role women have in, in this organization, but they do make up a large part of the individuals who run services and guardians of children. This TA center looks to help connect and assist guardians, but the large percentage are women. You can go to the next slide. Uh, serious Mental Illness Advisor, SMI Advisor. You can go to the next slide. Um, to advance the use of person-centered approach to care that ensures people who have SMI find the treatment and support they need. For clinicians, we offer access to education, data, and consultation so you can make evidence-based treatment decisions for individuals, families, friends, people who have questions, or people who care for someone with SMI. We offer access to resources and answers from a national network of experts. This is the mission for SMI advisor. And we can go to the next slide. So in July of 2018, the American Psychiatric Association was awarded a five-year, 14.2 million grant from, the, from SAMHSA to establish a clinical support system for serious mental illness. This is how SMI Advisor began and its purpose to support clinical care. The SMI Advisor team leads a broad team of experts and organizations who work on the project. This team includes experts in clinical treatment, peer support, recovery, patient and family engagement, instructional design, technology, and marketing. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a little video about SMI Advisor. Is it able to play? Great. Oh no, we can't hear it.
Oh, there's no sound. Well, I can share it in the chat. I don't want to take up too much time trying to get this video. It's only about a minute and a half. Um, but the great part about this video, why I'm sharing it, is it's really showing how SMI Advisor works um, and what kind of resources are within um, what SMI Advisor has. So I'll share it in the chat afterwards. It's really a really quick um, look overview of uh, the services and um, resources that are available. So we can go to the next slide, that's all right. So when we're looking at SMI Advisor, um, like I said in the beginning of this presentation, at SAMHSA we don't have anything that is women specific, but at SMI Advisor, the only thing that is women specific is pregnancy. So mental illness and pregnancy and uh, anything that might come around that. Um, so whenever you search, I'm showing you a screenshot of exactly searching pregnancy. And so if you have, um, any questions on pregnancy and maybe working with a client who suffers from um, severe mental illness, um, this might help. And um, within SMI Advisor, you can search many different um, co-occurring issues that might come up for a client. And you can go to the next slide. So when, uh, like before, when I was showing, um, so if you type in pregnancy and you saw one of those boxes, um, I just clicked on one and took a screenshot of it. And this is an example of something that you can see within SMI Advisor. Um, so this one was uh, what treatments are available for postpartum depression or depression after childbirth. It gives you um, some information as well as um, some programs that are available and other resources that you can access. And this is a very easy search and everything is quite condensed in SMI Advisor. It's really there for the clinician to be able to find information quickly without doing an extensive amount of research because your time is valuable. So SMI Advisor is taking all of that work out so you can quickly look and see what is available to you. And you can go to the next slide. Um, some SAMHSA resources. Uh, this is the SAMHSA homepage. This is full of so much, so many resources. I'm getting to be thinking about it. Um, <laughs> um, many of you are practitioners in this um, event today. Um, there are trainings in there. There are places to find treatment. There is data. There are different grants that you can apply to. There's just news about mental health, um, publications. This really has everything. Um, it even is talking about you know, the 988 rollout. And maybe on here it says the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You know, just a lot of things that are happening. And this is a, a great resource just to bookmark um, to look up any mental health um, information that might be coming up. And you can go to the next slide. So in this slide, um, someone is going to put this into the uh, chat, but these are just all the links that I talked about, including a couple extra. So I have the SAMHSA resource and the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center, National Federation of Families. I included a, a resource on certified clinical behavioral health clinics that didn't quite fit in my presentation today, but it's a good resource to go over and see what is available there. And then something a little bit more specific for women and um, mental health, um, clinical guidance for perinatal addiction. Um, that is not necessarily my field of expertise. So I wanted to share that document and hopefully you can disseminate the information, uh, information from there. And it's a very great document. And as well as SMI advisor. Um, and the next slide. Well, that, that is all I have for you today. Um, thank you so much for your time and I hope you get a lot out of your, uh, the presentations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers from 2020 Mom. Uh, Joy Burkhardt is the founder and executive director of 2020 Mom. She was inspired to found uh, the organization after several of her worlds collided, including losing her little brother to suicide, learning the complexities of the US health and mental health system while working for a health insurer and becoming directly involved in healthcare policy change and experiencing the realities of birth and the postpartum period with her firstborn. She recognized she was not in a unique position, uh, she, excuse me, she was in a unique position to learn why mothers and others were not uh, being treated for mental health disorders in the same way that they were for medical conditions. Her most gratifying projects at 2020 Mom have included hosting the organization's annual forums, which bring together hundreds of change agents pushing the envelope in the fields of maternal and mental health, as well as the National Coalition for Maternal Mental Health. Uh, which convenes nonprofits with shared interests in addressing gaps in maternal mental health. She's been recognized for her leadership and vision with several awards, including receiving the American Public Health Association's Maternal Child Health Leadership and Advocacy Award, California's American Mother of Achievement Award, 
the Emerging Leader Award in Women's Health from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Women's Health, and Cigna's Volunteer of the Year Award. Joy lives with her husband and two junior high school aged children in Los Angeles, California. And also presenting with uh, Joy today is uh, Cindy Herrick. Cindy serves as 2020 Mom Strategic Partnerships and National Campaigns Lead. She also runs the Maternal Suicide Awareness Campaign, as well as the Maternal Mental Health Week Awareness Campaign under 2020 Moms Awareness Brand, the Blue Dot Project. Her own experience with severe maternal mental health disorders in 2012 sparked her desire to bring change to the maternal mental health care system, as well as work towards mainstreaming the discussion about maternal mental health. Cindy's a certified peer support specialist and a, su a subject matter expert for the Arizona Department of Health Services, ADHS, Maternal Mortality Board. She's also on ADHS's Arizona Maternal Mental Health Task Force, where she chairs the awareness work group. Cindy's a uh, also a patient merit reviewer for Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. Uh, prior to joining 2020 Mom, Cindy was a graduate instructor and researcher at Arizona State University, specializing in autism spectrum disorders. She also founded her own piano music studio in 2007, created to meet the individual needs of both neurotypical students and students on the autism spectrum. She currently resides in Phoenix, Arizona with her husband and son. And thank you to both of our speakers from 2020 Mom. Excellent. Um, thanks so much. Um, we're glad to be here and we can advance to the next slide, Stephen. As Stephen mentioned, I'm Joy Burkhardt. I'm the founder. We can ad advance to the next slide. Um, so a little bit about 2020 Mom before we jump in. Uh, our mission is to close gaps in maternal mental health care. And we do this work through policy and healthcare systems change. Um, we were recently um, uh, named a field catalyst for the field of maternal mental health by a trusted a consulting firm in the nonprofit space, and we've been around for 10 years. At the heart of our work, we really believe the statement here on the bottom of the slide that families, employers, and society, all of us who are paying for healthcare benefits, including mental health benefits, are entitled to receive screening, diagnosis, and treatment within the health care system. We also believe that services like doula support, certified peer support, et cetera, should be part of the healthcare delivery system. So next slide. I always like to start with these statements when we're talking about maternal mental health. And you'll notice I'm talking about depression here and the field of maternal mental health is not limited to depression, but most of the research started in this space. So let's um, get started. Did you know that women in their childbearing age years account for the largest group of Americans with depression. Did you know that the American Academy of Pediatrics has noted that prevalence of depression and anxiety in teen girls is skyrocketing? We know that of course now with the COVID crisis and that was the case before the crisis. Also, did you know maternal depression is the most common complication of childbirth? Did you know that there are more new cases of mothers suffering from maternal depression each year than women diagnosed with new cases of breast cancer? And despite all of this, did you know that, that maternal mental health disorders largely go undiagnosed and untreated here in the US? Next slide. So you hear about various terms when you hear about maternal mental health. Some in the field still might say postpartum depression, as you heard me mention earlier, this was the disorder that was researched first. So there's um, a lot of research and often it's um, used to talk about uh, uh, the umbrella. Um, we actually believe it's important not to use the term postpartum depression as the umbrella term because we can do harm uh, when we use that term. We also want to share that onset of these disorders are almost as frequent in pregnancy as in the postpartum period. So another reason to avoid the term postpartum depression if we're talking about that umbrella uh, set of disorders. Another term you might hear about, it's all the same thing, are PMADs, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. It's often still used, sometimes still used by clinicians. Um, in the field though, it's become a no-no and that is because of the acronym MAD, unless people spell it out, um, which often isn't the case, uh, uh, folks have found that maternal mental health has been an easier term to use for that reason. So again, why use maternal mental health? Um, it's easy for non-clinicians and clinicians to understand. Uh, it leaves no disorder out or a time period out, and it also offers hope, maternal mental health. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy, who you've already met. She's going to provide just a brief overview of what these range of disorders are before we get back to some of the meat around why women aren't being screened and diagnosed. Cindy. Thank you so much, Joy. Next slide. 
So as Joy previously said, postpartum depression has been incorrectly used as an umbrella term for all maternal mental health disorders. So now it's important to understand what spectrum of disorders and conditions actually fall under the range of maternal mental health disorders. So I'm gonna give you a little brief overview so you understand the range of disorders we're actually talking about when we say maternal mental health disorders. So the first two, um, we have maternal depression and um, dysthymia, which is persistent depressive disorder. Um, so up to 20% or one in five women experience maternal depression. Um, however, I'd like to note that a lot of these prevalence rates were, were done before the pandemic and research has shown that this number has more than doubled since the pandemic. Um, dysthymia is also another form of depression um, that is more persistent, whereas uh, Maternal depression is a major depressive disorder. It's more intense, usually two weeks of symptoms. Um, dysthymia uh, doesn't happen until at least two years. Uh, next, please. Anxiety is almost as prevalent as depression. And as Joy said, um, a lot of these disorders can happen during pregnancy or during the postpartum period or both. Um, anxiety happens to up to 15% of women. And again, um, because of the pandemic, this is greatly possibly shifted, you know, these numbers were conducted before the pandemic. And some research has shown that the pandemic has raised um, the, the level of anxiety and depression symptoms among pregnant and postpartum women. Next, we have birth-related PTSD. The prevalence of PTSD is 3.1%. Um, and as a leading researcher in this field has said, you know, trauma is is in the eye of the beholder. So if there is trauma that is experienced by the mother at some point during pregnancy or the postpartum period, they're at risk for um, PTSD. And just an interesting fact, 34% of new mothers report experiencing a traumatic childbirth experience. So while this isn't, uh, this doesn't mean that they will directly have PTSD, it definitely increases their risk. Next, please. Maternal OCD. So this is definitely an area that has been consistently misunderstood and definitely needs more research in the maternal mental area space. In fact, this has been such a gap that 2020 Mom has been focused on closing this gap through our partnership with the International OCD Foundation to create a maternal OCD resource center. Um, more studies are needed to identify a consistent rate of prevalence for maternal OCD. Um, one study found that Maternal OCD affects about two in 10 women during pregnancy and two to three women in every 100 women in the year after giving birth. Um, but definitely more studies are needed and we think that the actual numbers may be higher. Um, it is really important to better understand maternal OCD because lack of proper training and diagnosis and understanding the symptoms, which include things like intrusive thoughts, can contribute to a wrongful diagnosis of postpartum psychosis, which I'm going to hit on next. And this can really further traumatize moms who go and ask for help for maternal OCD and get misdiagnosed for something like postpartum psychosis. Um, so going on to postpartum psychosis, it's an extremely rare condition and it only happens in approximately one to two out, out of a thousand deliveries. Um, and this is usually, these are usually the cases when they go untreated, um, where we hear some of the tragic stories we hear in the news, but it is definitely treatable, but it is a definite medical emergency risk. So we, this is an um, emergency and we ask people to go for help immediately. Next slide, please. Now here are just some other features and factors. I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, birth loss and grief, mania. Uh, mania can be a precursor to psychosis. So it's really important that mothers receive clinical support. Um, a lot of times we see the onset of bipolar disorder either during pregnancy or in the postpartum period for the first time. Um, the baby blues, which up to 80% of women will experience. The difference between that and it morphing into depression is if it persists beyond two weeks, it is likely that the mother may be experiencing depression. And the last one, intrusive thoughts, which is associated with maternal OCD. Um, these are the scary thoughts, unwanted scary thoughts that people get. And I think this statistic is very important to highlight that 70 to 100% of women and their partners have these scary, unwanted scary thoughts um, surrounding childbirth in the postpartum period. Um, now, if these intrusive thoughts aren't well managed or addressed, um, they can sometimes be tied to OCD if they get more severe. 
So now I'm going to turn it back to Joy, who's going to continue telling you a little bit more about our work. Great. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, just wanted to share with folks that 2020 Moms work from um, uncovering the root cause of why women aren't being routinely uh, screened and diagnosed and treated are well documented in the reports that you'll find on our website. We'll make sure that link is um, dropped in the chat. Here's a couple screenshots of those reports. We have several issue briefs on important topics like screening for maternal mental health um, disorders, what are the barriers and opportunities, as well as um, the use of certified peer support specialists. Next slide. All right, so what we believe, you've already heard me touch on some of this work, but the first bullet is that we think the healthcare system should work for all of those suffering from mental health disorders and especially and including um, uh, the maternal population. We also believe that treatment shortages must be addressed with urgency. Uh, our friends at the American Medical Association talk about how OBGYNs and primary care providers, if they don't have a line of sight and don't have providers they can refer to, they're not going to screen for these disorders. Um, it makes sense because they don't have capacity to treat or uh, knowledge um, in some cases to treat in the range of treatments that are available. Um, we also know that reproductive psychiatrists, therapists, and certified peer support specialists and doulas um, are, should be addressed with urgency. And that obstetricians, in particular, the medical home for um, mothers during the perinatal period um, should have built capacity to address mild to moderate depression and anxiety, leaving the psychiatrists to top, uh, practice at the top of their licensure and that they need more support in doing that. Um, we also believe providers need to be educated and tested to do no harm. Um, there are great efforts underway through ABOG um, and ACOG uh, and, uh, of course, the American Psychiatric Association and our partners at the Marseille Society of North America to ensure that OBs and psychiatrists are um, receiving the training and support that they need. And training is also available with Postpartum Support International for therapists um, and others. So the other thing that 2020 Mom has really focused on is the role of health insurers and hospitals. Um, we believe that payers and insurers, including Medicaid agencies, employers, and private insurers, commercial insurers, play a critical role in closing gaps in mental health and maternal mental health. We also recognize that hospitals as the hub of birth here in the U.S., um, still it's 98% of births happen in a hospital setting, really can um, play a vital role in scaling change. Next slide. Um, we also want to acknowledge that it's really important not just to focus on that uh, right side of the screen here, the health delivery system, and um, also focusing upstream, identifying root causes. What are the stressors mothers are facing and how do we prevent them? Our colleagues at Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance are diving into this in a deeper way, which we're excited about. You'll hear more from Adrian in just a moment. Um, next slide. So we also like to think about the levers for change um, with what we call the seven solutions or the seven S's. Um, practical support, so how do women get support? Again, on that left-hand side of the tree, um, uh, practical support uh, with things that you can imagine are important uh, when you have a new baby at home. Social support, critically important. That's um, the support that peers and neighbors and family members may provide by um, uh, with emotional support. Self-care, uh, we know what that is. I'm taking care of oneself physically, emotionally, um, and um, through efforts like uh, eating appropriately, for example. That's hard for some folks, particularly um, women that are facing multiple stressors and social economic uh, stressors, for example. Screening to identify these disorders. Uh, we've already touched on that just a bit. Um, there's more information on our website. I know Adrian also has some information to share about screening as well. What are the validated tools? Um, you can find all of those, um, those tools on our website. Systems integration. So again, if we know that the obstetric office is the primary medical home for mothers during this time, how can we integrate mental health screening, detection, treatment within an OB setting? What about stepped care? Um, some of you may know about the stepped care approach, right? What level of care um, it, does a mother uh, need? And we have gaps here in the maternal mental health space. Uh, OBs might prescribe um, a, a antidepressant, for example, or hope that if they prescribe um, talk therapy, a mother actually doesn't have to wait for eight weeks 
or have struggles finding someone in network to get that therapy. Um, and really right now it's um, those options or the ER. Uh, we have very few um, inpatient programs and very few outpatient pro treatment programs like IOP programs in the United States. So more work to do there around step care options. And then people ask about what about smartphone enabled services? And of course there's a role there. Um, we also believe it's really important to think about integrating those options through the obstetric primary home um, to ensure that um, it's well integrated in that OBs and our medical systems not let off the hook um, for providing the mental health services that we are all paying for. Next slide. So what do the professional clinical associations say? Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics needs to be applauded for the, as the first association to uh, recommend screening in pediatric settings through their Bright Futures Task Force in 2010. Um, one of the challenges with pediatric screening is that the mother is not the pediatrician's patient. So when this is happening, it's largely a piece of paper with the questions, um, the screening questionnaire and resources on the back of the the page is still better than nothing, but we believe um, there should be much more integration and that obstetricians should be screening starting in pregnancy. ACOG um, first recommended screening for um, this population in 2017. Um, thank you, ACOG, for that work. Um, that triggered some additional updates, including uh, overturn of recommendations by the US Preventive Services Task Force, who previously did not recommend screening. Um, once ACOG uh, uh, issued their position, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued theirs. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we heard previously that um, it means that payers need to cover screening, um, cannot die, deny um, screening to, um, to patients. Um, what we have found, though, is that screening still doesn't happen routinely, even though it's covered. It doesn't mean that providers are conducting screening and know how to bill for screening. So implementation is still very much a problem. And then finally wanted to um, share that AHRQ is not specific to maternal mental health, but has um, indicated that uh, only 35% of adults were screened for depression. Uh, that was the latest um, report in 2019 um, using 2015 data. So we again sit maternal uh, mental health sort of sits in this larger problematic um, um, a situation that is not unique to mothers, but um, mental health providers um, uh, in general are correct. PCPs in general are still struggling with men mental health screening. Next slide. So what about then Medicaid uh, coverage and insurance? So you already heard me talk about how insurers need to cover screening and detection. Um, we also know that healthcare coverage, of course, is foundational. And many of you, especially on this call, know that there's a great effort underway to expand and extend um, pregnancy Medicaid through the full year um, postpartum, which we're excited about. But we also just wanted to point out that coverage doesn't mean the system will work. Um, there, it hasn't been working for those with coverage for quite some time. There's no universal system of care in the US, right? Um, no, no tracking uh, around clinical practice guidelines being adopted widely. Um, and we say it's not like a Starbucks infrastructure, right? Where you get the same thing everywhere, every time, um, that it's not predictable. One provider might screen and another may not. Um, and we're really dependent on um, the practices of individual providers to put these systems in place um, and for payers to incentivize these practices. Next slide. Um, what about screening and measurement? So I just did wanna quickly highlight that there, um, there is now, I'm gonna skip to the last point, there's now um, a HEDIS measure for maternal mental health um, disorders, maternal depression to start, which is a great starting point, even though we know there's a range of disorders that providers should be screening for. Um, we should be seeing those rates reported nationally in um, September of this year. Really excited about uh, the availability of that new HEDIS measure, which 23 Mom helped to advocate for. Next slide. And then one of my final slides is just to share what's happening in the state. So 2020 Mom um, has been involved in championing state policy and supporting um, our fellows involved in state policy, both in uh, state agencies like public health departments and in nonprofits leading legislative change. I'm not gonna go over all of this here. You'll have access to the slides later, but wanted to give you a snapshot of what's happening. And it's quite possible that this map um, does not capture 
all of the activity happening. So if you're in a state and know that your public health department, for example, is doing something or just heard about a new bill, we would love to hear um, about that from you. So next slide. Um, finally, just wanna share that there are awareness materials that we have on our website, like palm cards that can be customized. We also have whole mom hospital and insurer best practice checklists. So what can insurers and hospitals start to do to move the needle? Uh, we have a resource center on maternal suicide and um, a resource center around the use of state certified peer support specialists. And um, with that, I have one last slide, I think, the forum. Yep. We host a convening every year with multiple stakeholders. We invite you to check it out. Um, materials are available on our website from this year's forum and on our YouTube channel. And with that, I'm happy to turn it back to Adrian and Steven. Thank you. Thank you, Joy and Cindy. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Adrian Griffin. Adrian's an advocate and a subject matter expert in maternal mental health. Prior to joining MMHLA, Adrian founded Postpartum Support Virginia and served as executive director for 10 years, where she established a statewide network of peer-led support groups, created educational programs for mental health providers and maternal child health care professionals, and helped pass legislation requiring information about postpartum depression and anxiety be provided to new mothers. Adrian graduated from the United States Naval Academy and has a master's in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Adrian and her family live in Arlington, Virginia. Over to you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for taking time from your very busy days to be here and learn about maternal mental health. I have the honor and privilege of leading Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance and I'm going to focus on what's next. So policies, programs, and novel approaches. So next slide, please. So a little bit about my background. As Stephen said, I graduated from the Naval Academy. I worked at the Pentagon. I worked at the White House. I worked for the United Nations. I was large and in charge. I was on track to like live in my best life. And then I had my son, John, and my, uh, I had significant postpartum depression after he was born. I had a very scary emergency C-section. He um, didn't sleep very much. Um, and between having a toddler and a newborn, I was slowly losing my mind. And it took me about six months to get the help that I needed. Despite having every privilege possible, I live outside of Washington, DC. I had insurance, I had a husband, I had the internet. Um, and I kept thinking during this dark time in my life, I need to do something so that other women don't suffer as I did. So I started volunteering with Postpartum Support International. As Stephen said, then I ran Postpartum Support Virginia for 10 years and now lead MMHLA to focus on national policy. Next slide, please. So just a quick recap of what uh, Joy and Cindy have been talking about. Maternal mental health conditions are actually the most common complication of pregnancy and childbirth, affecting at least one in five pregnant or postpartum people and up to one in three in high-risk populations. These untreated conditions can have long-term negative impacts on mother, baby, family, and society. And we know that there is a significant financial cost of not treating these conditions. It's also really important to note that the majority of people who experience maternal mental health disorders or perinatal mental health issues go untreated. Next slide, please. We can't talk about maternal health if we, unless, without talking about maternal mortality. So the slide on the left should not be a surprise to anybody. This has been um, in the news for the last five years or so, um, the US maternal mortality rate continues to rise it is the only, we are the only industrialized nation where the maternal mortality rate is actually rising. Um, and this information comes from maternal mortality review committees, uh, which uh, published a report in I think 2017 or 2019, showing that seven women, 700 women die each year during pregnancy or the first year following pregnancy. And that women of color die at three to four times the rate of white women. So we really have been focusing on these racial disparities over the last several years. But also what was included in that report is that suicide and overdose combined are the leading cause of death in the first year postpartum. Women during this time frame use the most lethal means. They want to end their lives. They are so desperate. Fewer than half actually attend their postpartum obstetric visit, but the majority of women who commit suicide in the postpartum period visit their emergency department within a month of committing suicide. And we know that the peak incidence of suicide is six to nine months postpartum. So you heard Joy mention the need to extend pregnancy-related Medicaid coverage for the first year postpartum. 
um, and the need for pediatricians to be screening. So two important ways that we can help make sure that moms are being taught in a safe manner. Next slide, please. I don't even need to say anything else. The additional anxiety that moms are feeling because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and now the formula shortage. Can we just add insult to injury? Next slide, please. So why should we care? I'm just gonna let you think about this for a moment. How is it possible that in the country that spends the most per capita on healthcare, we have a system that allows mental health complications to be the most common complication of becoming a new parent, and that suicide and overdose are the leading cause of death for new mothers. We ought to be ashamed. We ought to be galvanized. We ought to do something now to make sure that women, pregnant and postpartum people, are educated about and screen for mental health conditions and get the care that they need. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to address this? Next slide. Fortunately, we're starting at the top. The president's FY23 budget actually included this exact phrasing, which it was a formal document that puts the whole federal budgeting process into motion. Recognizing that maternal mental health conditions are the most common complications of pregnancy and childbirth, the budget funds two specific programs, a dedicated maternal mental health hotline and grants to states. Next slide, please. There are also three pieces of legislation currently being considered by Congress that would address maternal mental health issues at the national, state, and local levels. So the first is Into the Light, which would authorize and fund those programs that, was, that were mentioned in the president's budget. So that's the dedicated maternal mental health hotline and grants to states to create programs. The Triumph for New Moms Act would establish a national task force and create a national strategy. Unfortunately, both of these pieces of legislation have been included in the House mental health bill that's moving forward. And then the third piece of legislation is the Moms Matter Act, which would address inequities in perinatal or maternal mental health, creating grants for community-based programs and growing and diversifying the workforce. Next slide, please. Just a word or two about the maternal mental health hotline. You heard it mentioned earlier. It was launched on Mother's Day. Um, it's a HRSA service with a contract with Postpartum Support International, which is the world's leading organization in providing support, information, encouragement, and help to parents affected by maternal mental health conditions. It's 24-7, 365, voice and text, English and Spanish, uh, staffed by licensed and credentialed healthcare and certified peer specialists. Um, the, if you call the hotline, you can get education, information, support, and brief intervention as well as resources and referrals. And the hotline does have reciprocal agreements with other hotlines like the new 988 suicide prevention line and the domestic violence. Next slide, please. So the, uh, you heard Joy talk quite a bit about screening. Uh, we've recognized that you know, screening is inadequate, insufficient, not happening uh, as well as it should. So we, along with the March of Dimes, have launched a year-long effort to synthesize existing screening recommendations from a variety of different organizations to create a draft framework for maternal mental health screening and education. Whenever we say screening, we also mean patient education. It's not just simply handing a mom a piece of paper. It's talking to her, explaining that these issues are very common, asking her how she's doing, making sure she knows that this is the most common complication of pregnancy and childbirth. So women will actually see a healthcare provider about 25 times during the routine screening period from conception through a full year following pregnancy. And so what the draft framework is uh, recommending or suggesting that screening happen at least each trimester prior to discharge from the hospital within three weeks postpartum, and then during all regularly scheduled obstetric and pediatric visits in that first year following pregnancy. Next slide, please. So there are other key players when we think about maternal mortality. Of course, of course, the maternal mortality review committees, which are state organizations that identify, review, and analyze maternal deaths. And then they disseminate um, findings, which then the perinatal quality collaboratives typically pick up these findings and figure out ways to address them, often working with hospital systems, often working with the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, which is a national partnership that provides evidence-based 
patient safety and quality improvement resources, what they call safety bundles, on specific topics so that hospitals, obstetric providers, primary care providers can actually take action um, that, that kind of dials all the way back to address issues uncovered by the MMRC. Next slide, please. Of course, one of the key players is ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, as Joy mentioned, uh, they have come up with screening recommendations. Also, uh, a new document, Committee Opinion 736, talking about optimizing postpartum care, um, talking about the fourth trimester or those four, first three months of baby's life and the first three months of the new mother's life. And they'll be issuing new guidance on screening and assessment and managing maternal mental health issues through psychopharmacology. And I also do want to also point out that ACOG this year chose as one of their two pieces of legislation to support maternal mental health issues. Next slide, please. Psychiatry access programs are fabulous programs at the state level that basically provide three specific things, trainings and toolkits to frontline providers, such as obstetricians and their staff, so that they can treat sort of the milder cases of anxiety and depression, real-time psychiatric consultation for more complex cases, and then resources and referrals for those affected by maternal mental health conditions. Uh, these, this program actually is modeled after a program in Massachusetts called MCPAP for Moms, and the leadership from MCPAP for Moms actually convenes leaders from all of the different states on the right who are implementing psychiatry access programs through an organization called Lifeline for Moms. So they meet quarterly for professional development and networking um, and you know, helping each other out. And on the right, as I said, are all the states that are implementing psychiatry access programs. And those highlighted in yellow are ones that have received federal funding from legislation that was introduced five years ago that we're trying to reauthorize to increase the number of state grants. And next slide, please. And wouldn't it be better if we could prevent rather than treat these programs? So there are three evidence-based prevention programs listed here, Mothers and Babies, Roses, and PrEP. Each one uh, takes a slightly different approach, but primarily focused on low-income low women during the final stages of pregnancy and the early um, uh, days of the postpartum period. Um, in fact, we're so excited about these programs that we are working with um, the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services to host a sub summit on these three prevention programs on Monday, May 23rd. And information uh, about that will be shared with all of you afterwards as well. We'd love for you to join that summit presentation. Next slide, please. And again, thank you for being with us today, taking time from your busy lives. Uh, I know that we have a few minutes left for Q&A, so I'll just turn that back over to Stephen. Thanks again. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to all of our speakers today. I want to encourage our participants to continue to put questions into the chat as we have the remaining uh, period here within the hour to, to hear from our fabulous speakers today. One question that's come through to us today, and this is open to everyone, of course, is um, about how what we've learned during the impacts of the, the current pandemic we can build upon the lessons of leveraging telehealth during the perinatal period. And I think we have a lot of examples. We heard of opportunities there, but would love to hear more from our speakers about some of those. Sure. Um, well, Adrian, jump in here if you'd like to as well. We, we've certainly found that um, the pandemic has done a lot of great things for mothers, including increasing uh, ease of access to behavioral health services um, during the pandemic, working from home if possible, Etc. Um, and so we are absolutely in support of continuing um, the policies that were put in place to allow for telehealth to be extended during the pandemic and want to encourage um, uh, those policies to continue uh, as long as possible and indefinitely. Um, and Adrian, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about uh, the work around MCPAP again, uh, telepsychiatry consultation and how the pandemic may have uh, influenced that work. Absolutely. So we you know telehealth has really uh, removed many barriers to care that new mothers face. Transportation, child care, um, you know, time away from family or work. Uh, and I mean, telehealth is not, not perfect, but it really has removed some of those barriers to care. And so we're working hard to um, make sure that the, the provisions that were rolled back around telehealth during the pandemic remain rolled back. Uh, we want to make sure that you know moms are able to access. Everybody's able to access care uh, in 
in the easiest way as possible. And we know that ACOG is actually looking at lining up um, more telehealth visits in the future um, and fewer in-person visits. So I think telehealth is really uh, here to stay. Thank you all for those. Um, another question we're hearing, we got a number of questions uh, sort of around screening overall and a couple of the presentations we heard about the challenges regarding both willingness to screen around uh, providers potentially not knowing um, how to refer out or what to refer to, um, but also about knowing about organizational capacity to refer to those services. Do speakers want to touch upon some opportunities there or kind of potential uh, promising practices you've heard from your stakeholders? Sure, I, uh, I'll go first and then um, Joy can chime in. I mean, we hear over and over again from providers, you know, that they're not trained about these issues, they're not reimbursed for screening, and they don't know where to send moms for help. Well, I wouldn't screen either if I, if I didn't know those three things. Um, so now with this dedicated maternal mental health hotline, uh, anybody can be referred to that hotline. And Postpartum Support International, um, which is actually staffing the hotline, um, has volunteer coordinators, volunteers in every single state. They have specialized coordinators for unique groups like parents who have a baby in the NICU or military parents or parents who have um, suffered uh, miscarriage. Um, similarly, they have over 20 online support groups a week. So I always say that while there are not enough resources, there are resources. And I always start with Postpartum Support International. That's great. Um, I'll just add with our interest in supporting the health delivery system, um, we are really looking at screening and integration um, it, with sort of two levers for change to support um, obstetricians. In addition to the telepsychiatry consultation program, um, uh, we're, we're looking at things like care coordination and case management. So once a mother is um, identified with a positive screen, who can support linkage to care, um, monitor whether or not mo mother went into care, um, needs more support. And we think there's two options to support um, those levers. One is uh, the use of insurer developed care coordination programs. And many of you may know that insurers offer a case management care coordination programs for things like diabetes care, low back pain, even eating disorders. Um, and we think that insurers should be developing such programs for maternal mental health. Um, uh, ideally, all of them would, and uh, OBs wouldn't have to figure out um, who, what insurance is doing, you know, what for each patient, um, that this would be available across the board. The other lever we see um, and are quite excited about um, looking to pilot in a third pilot around the use of state certified peer support specialists is embedding certified peers within um, OB care settings, whether it's virtually or on site um, to provide screening actually to deliver screening and provide it in a way that uh, reduces stigma, also provide brief intervention for those at risk um, uh, or suffering uh, as they get into care and that care coordination support on an ongoing basis. You know, and I just want to add in here that you know we're putting a lot on the clinical system and the medical system, but we all also have to shoulder the burden. We all know mothers. We all have mothers. We all need to ask new mothers, how are you doing? What can I do to help? Can I fold the laundry? Can I take the baby so you can take a shower, right? We need a better social support system around our mothers as well. So I just leave that with everybody. This is my challenge to you. Um, when you know somebody who is a new mother, reach out and offer to help. Thank you, Adrian, for what I think is an excellent closing point there. And thank you to all of our speakers for uh, being part of today's uh, Women's Health Leadership Series webinar in observance of National Women's Health Week with our particular focus on women's mental health. Um, just want to encourage all of our participants to sign up for HRSA eNews as well so you can uh, stay in the loop on all the HRSA activities and opportunities, both NOFO and other programmatic activities. Uh, and we will be circulating a recording link uh, available to everybody who registered today in the next week or so. And once again, thank you all for your time and participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.